Okay. All right. Welcome to the stages of spiritual growth. This is uh, uh, track number three uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the spiritual growth series. And before we get into track three, starting with track three, I just want to point out to you uh, again what the different tracks are and why they are important. The Bible is very, very clear about the different stages of spiritual growth. And this is one of the reasons why when people begin their walk with God that, uh, that they're not able to digest some of the information that we get as Christians. Sometimes as Christians, we'll hear a message, for example, on the anointing of God, and it sounds so good. Man, when the anointing of God is flowing, this is happening and that's happening. And we're excited and we want to get in it. And sometimes even people will start trying to operate in the anointing of God. Everybody say flake. flake. Everybody say no flakes. No flakes. No fl that's what happens is people will hear a, a message on the anointing and operating on the anointing and the power of the anointing of God. And they'll want to operate in that, not realizing that is for people who have reached a certain spiritual maturity level. And if we're still over here, we're still learning some certain things. We're still learning to deal with envy. We're still learning to deal with hypocrisy. If you can't, until you have learned to deal with evil speaking and envy and understanding the dominion and rule of God, how to persevere, and then over here, how to, uh, envy's on here twice, overcoming strife, division, uh, sonship, it's backwards, uh, repentance, faith, until laying on of hands, until we get this stuff down, we're going to be dangerous trying to deal with some of this stuff over here. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, this, is, this is why there are things uh, overcoming the devil. Uh, well, Jesus Christ paid for our ability to overcome the devil. He paid for that on the cross. So we are victorious over the devil, but understanding what that is and being able to, to move from defense mode where I'm trying to keep the devil off my back to now I'm over here where I'm encroaching on the enemy's territory and now he's afraid of me. That that's in this spiritual maturity level. And so we have, to, uh, we have to get these things under our belt first. How many of you know you should learn to tie shoes before you buy shoes? So uh, this is all review for you. I know all of you have already seen this, but I just want to remind you because we're going to see some interesting things here in the book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, if you would turn with me there. Uh, Nicole, is Nicole in here? Where's Nicole? Okay. Tammy, I need your help with something. On Nicole's desk, there are, uh, there are some pages that have the stages of spiritual growth on them. Uh, do you know what they look like, what I'm talking about? Okay, would you bring those in here? There's a whole stack of them. Hey, guys, come on up. Would you do me a favor? Come right up here on the front row. Would you do that? I want your nice, shining, the backs of your heads on the video here. Okay, great. Um, in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. It says this, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. The Greek word here that's used for little children, it's the Greek word technion, T-E-K-N-I-O-N, technion. And it actually means a little child. It's one of the uh, words for a little child. And this is actually the last one we're going to be talking about here. We have we've, uh, talked about all of these things here. And we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to be talking about uh, forgiveness, understanding, being forgiven. That's the last one here. That's a, that's a two-week lesson. It's this week and next week. Then the week after that, we're going to be moving to here. And we're going to be moving to this maturity stage. Who's excited about that? Everybody say, growing is good. Would you just pass those out there? I want everybody just to, uh, to be able to see where they're at and uh, see uh, what we're dealing with here. Track, one's track, track one, track two, and track three. So this is uh, track two, lesson number one. Track three, lesson number one. So uh, here it says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's the word technion. Now that's what we want to talk about tonight. But before we talk about that, I want to move on a little farther in here. And I want to show you how some of these Greek words are used. Verse 13. 
I write to you fathers because you have known him who that you have known him who is from the beginning. Then it says, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. That word young men in the Greek is the the Greek word uh, neoniskos, N-E-A-N-I-S-K-O-S for those of you that care. It's It's pronounced neoniskos and neoniskos means an adolescent. So you see, he taught, he was talking to toddlers before uh, about uh, understanding forgiveness. Then he moves on and he says, now adolescents, I want to talk to you about overcoming the wicked one. Then he says, now watch this. This is tricky. I write to you the last part of verse 13. Everybody following me? The last part of verse 13, I write to you little children because you have known the father. This word little children is the Greek word paidon, P-A-I-D-O-N, and it means an adolescent also. It's not the same little children as in verse 12 that says toddlers. This is a different Greek word. So basically he's saying, I write to you toddlers because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. And then the last part of verse 13, I'm writing to you adolescents because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you more adolescents because you have known the father. Verse 14, I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And then I have written to you young men. This is the same young man as up there, Neoniskos, that means adolescents because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So it's important that we see that verse 12, he say, he's saying, I'm writing to you toddlers because your sins are forgiven. I want you to understand that your sins are forgiven. Then in verse 13, he's saying, now adolescents, I'm writing to you because you've overcome the wicked one. I'm writing to you uh, because you have known the father uh, because uh, adolescence, because you've known the father. And then the last part of verse 14, he says, you've, you're strong in the Lord, strong in the word of God and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So we see here that understanding forgiveness, if I, if you'll let me say this this way, understanding forgiveness is a prerequisite to uh, having an understanding of overcoming the wicked one. Now, every child of God, from the moment of their spiritual, uh, of their spiritual birth, every child of God has authority over the enemy. Every, as soon as a person raises their hand, prays the prayer, the blood of Jesus cleanses them from their sin, all this, the devil has lost them. They have authority over the enemy. The thing is, you can't have an understanding of having authority over the enemy fully until you understand forgiveness and how forgiveness works. So that's why these are listed like this. That's that's why here, it's not on this list here because uh, Nicole ran out of room, but here we have um, um, understanding forgiveness and what forgiveness means to us. And then over here, now that you've got that, then you can have a complete understanding of overcoming the devil and how that works as well as these other things, knowing the Father, the urgency of the last days, et cetera. So does everybody see how this progression works? Good. Let's talk about um, understanding forgiveness. There are three major benefits of the cross. Everybody say, thank God for the cross. There are three major benefits of the cross. Benefit number one is redemption from our sin nature. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he caused him who knew no sin to become sin for us. And that sin, that word for sin that we've been studying here for the last several weeks is the Greek word hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, hamartia. And it means not just individual sins, but it's referring to your sin nature. He who did not, who knew no sin or did not have a hamartia, did not have a sin nature, became our sin nature for us. He took our sin nature on the cross that we might then become the righteousness of God in Christ. So the first two benefits of the major benefits of the cross, number one is redemption from our sin nature. That we're going to see in a few minutes is different than having our individual sins forgiven. 
then the second major benefit of the cross is the reception of the righteousness of God. And that is our new nature. And it's important that we as believers understand that God doesn't just intend for us to be forgiven of our sins and then eke out an existence until Jesus finally comes and rescues us from this wretched world. It is God's intention that we walk in a state of victory all the time. He became, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus Christ became who we were. He took our sin nature on the cross that we might become who he is, the righteousness of God in Christ. So we need to walk with our head up. Everybody sit up in your chair, real strong. Everybody throw your shoulders back. Everybody say, I am. I am. Oh, you're wimpy. Say, I am. I am. The righteousness of God. In Christ. Christ. And that's how we need to walk through life. Not, uh, I'm so whipped and beat down. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And we got that. That's not blasphemy. We got that from Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21. A few verses above that, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we become new creatures. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let me read that to you. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. So when Jesus died on the cross for us and he took our sin nature on the cross, it wasn't so that we could continue in the life that we had just minus our sins. It's a brand new life. You start all over again. The slate is clean. And it's not just, well, thank God I've been forgiven of my sins. But now you have a new destiny. You have a new purpose. God gives you new friends. You have a new family. Thank God for the family of God. I mean, everything, it all becomes new. And Understanding that as a believer is vital to our Christian life. Most people who make a decision to follow Christ and don't make it are only looking for fire insurance. I just don't want to go to hell. So if I pray the prayer, does that mean I don't go to hell? And we don't realize, no, Jesus died on the cross so you can have his nature and now you become a new creation and everything is new. You go, you know, the career. I was studying to be a symphony conductor. I was studying classical music. It was my life. I ate it, slept it, thought about it all the time, listened to, listened to it, read scores. I fell asleep in my bed reading scores and studying, learning classical music. And then over a summer break, I made a decision to follow Christ and my whole world was turned around. Then I went back to school for, in the fall and for the first couple of weeks I was thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What am I doing? It was my whole life last year. This year, I'm not interested in this anymore. Now, that's not to say that God can't continue to use you where you are in the business world and that kind of thing. But for me, everything changed. Everything changed. My friends changed. Everything changed. And that's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You become a new creature, a new creation. Everything becomes new. So the three major benefits of the cross, first of all, redemption from our sin nature. Second of all, the reception of the righteousness of God, our new nature. And thirdly, redemption from the curse. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says that uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, having become a curse for us on the cross. Uh, For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus hung on a tree, hung on the cross, and he took our curse, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So these are the three, uh, and redemption from the curse means redemption from sickness and disease, poverty and lack, discouragement, depression, despondency, all those things Jesus took on the cross and, and redeemed us from the curse. So he, re, he redeemed us from our sin nature. He, he gave us his nature. We become the righteousness of God. And then thirdly, he took our curse on the cross. Isn't this all good news? 
These benefits, and here's the kicker though, these benefits cannot be appropriated in the life of any person if there is the presence of sin. We can't be the righteous, which is, this is what trips people up when you start talking about, well, when you tell somebody, uh, even religious people, I mean, you tell Christians, you go to the mall and run into somebody that, that, you know, is wearing an I love Jesus button. And you tell them, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And that freaks people out. Now, I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. I just read to you 2 Corinthians 5.21, where Jesus said, he took our sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And uh, if, but if there's sin in the presence of in, in any believer's life, then we can't appropriate any of these benefits, not redemption from our sin nature. We cannot become the righteousness of God in Christ. And thirdly, uh, we can't be redeemed from the curse if there's a presence of sin in our life. So then everybody thinks, well, doesn't everybody have sin in their life? Does every, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. I mean, people sin sometimes. So doesn't everybody... Doesn't everybody have that? So how is this even possible? Remember, Jesus' blood took our sin nature on the cross so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. So we put too much stock. Should Christians sin? No. 1 John, we're going to look at 1 John in a few moments. 1 John 1.7, uh, uh, yeah, I believe it's 1.7, where John says, I'm writing to you, I'm writing this letter to you that you as believers do not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that doesn't mean that believers don't slip, believers don't sin, that, that something that we don't, oops, wow, I can't believe I did that. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to hell. That means that we confess our sins and then it's under the blood. But remember this, Jesus' death on the cross was not a spot cleaner. You ever get a spot on your rug and you spray it and spray it and spray it and then you spray it. You're not cleaning the whole rug. You're cleaning this one, this one place. But that's not what Jesus did on the cross. He didn't just go to your heart and, oh, I think I, I, think I little, see a little black place on your cross there. He, Jesus gave you a whole new nature, his nature. So this is why when you do sin, this is what conviction is. This is sin. It's, it's sin whether you got angry with somebody you shouldn't have gotten angry with or you said something you shouldn't have said or you did something you shouldn't have done, that's what conviction is, is it's bouncing around on the inside of you and it has no place to land anymore because your sin nature was taken on the cross. So this is why you feel so icky. Before I knew Jesus, I could sin and I was fine. After I knew Jesus, I could sin and I felt like throwing up because my whole nature changed. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? Your whole nature changes. So, um, come on, iPad, there we go. So, um, to begin the salvation process, now, most people do not understand everything that we're talking about here. I mean, here, many of you have been believers 10 years, 15 years, but when we're talking about this, in order for a person to make a decision to follow Christ, they don't have to go through all this and all this to get down to what we're talking about today. Because the blood works when people repent, uh, and most people do not understand this, but in order to be able to move on to overcoming the devil and actually having an, uh, an understanding of how that works and being able to encroach on his territory, that you have to have an understanding of this. We, we talked about the spot cleaner a moment ago. Most people, when they buy a bottle, of, if, I, if I need to clean a spot on my carpet and I can't get it up with anything. And so I go to the carpet store and I say, I got a spot on my carpet. It's, it's ink, a whole bottle of ink on my carpet. And we can't get it up. We tried this, tried that, tried that. And the, and she pulls something off the shelf and she says, this will do it right here. See, it says cleans ink. And she says, I've used this on terrible stains. It'll work. I'm not going to take that to the lab and do a big analysis on this thing. I'm taking it home. I'm spraying it on the carpet. Thank you, Jesus. It's working. So I spray it on there and the stain is gone. I have no idea how this thing works. 
So people apply the blood of Jesus to their life. When, okay, God loves you. God has a plan for your life. Because of sin, you've been, you're separated from God. And people are going, yes, I'm separated from Yes, I, you, that's me. But Jesus Christ came and he paid the price for your sin with his death on the cross so that you could be free. His blood washed away all your sins. Really? So what you need to do is apply this blood to your life. Okay, I'll do it. And you play it to the stain and praise God, the stain's gone. That doesn't mean they understand how it works. But it'll still, and I, there is a, you know, there is a, a certain amount of understanding that needs to happen. But for you to become a mature Christian in God, you need to understand what we're talking about right here. That this works, how this works. Hebrews chapter 9, I want you to turn with you there. And I, I can't teach on every, all of this tonight. We're going to pick this up next week and teach on this. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7. Everybody got it? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7. But into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, God instituted a, um, a program, if you will, to cover the sins of people. And it was the blood of animals that the priests would slaughter the blood of pure animals. And the Bible says that that blood would cover the sins, the, watch this, the individual sins of the people. It didn't remove their sin nature. It covered individual sins of the people. So they would have to bring sacrifices all the time and all the time. They're bringing sacrifices all the time. I mean, we've got records in the Bible where there were thousands of animals killed in a single day to cover the individual sins of people. That's the Old Testament. And so when then once a year, the high priest would go in uh, with blood and he would offer for himself and for the people's sins that they committed in ignorance. So people would bring sacrifices for the sins that they did, that they knew they committed. Then once a year, the whole high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and slaughter an animal for the sins that they committed that they didn't even know that they, they committed. This was a long, laborious process getting their sins covered. And verse 9, uh, verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who, who performed the services perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of restoration. But Christ... Verse 11, came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkled, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. So, and then look down at verse 22. There's a lot here. But verse 22 says, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So why is that? Why did, I mean, isn't God pretty barbaric slaughtering all these innocent animals to try to cover our sins? Can't we just say, I'm sorry. And God says, okay, you're ding, you're forgiven. And why do we have to do that? Just keep in mind that Genesis chapter nine, verse four and Deuteronomy 12, 23, both say the same thing. The life is in the blood. Blood is the most powerful substance on earth. That's why a person, you know, uh, I've got, I got a dad, for example. My dad uh, that lives in California, he is 84 years old this year. He doesn't have any kidneys. He has no kidneys. He goes to dialysis every morning. For an hour. They purify his blood. And then he goes about as he goes. He, he's got the first appointment at 6 a.m. every morning. 
He sits there for an hour, gets his blood purified. Then he goes about his day just like anybody else. Nobody would know the guy has no kidneys. He hasn't had kidneys for years. And then he goes about his day, goes home, goes to sleep. The next morning at 5.30, he gets up, goes to dialysis. They clean it, cleanse his blood. Then he goes about, he owns a car lot. 80, 84, I think he's 84 this year. He owns a car lot. He goes into work every day. Nobody, he can, he can live without kidneys. There are people whose hearts are beating and they're technically alive, but they are brain dead. Their brain is not even functioning, but their heart is still beating and they're still alive. But once their heart, which pumps blood, once their heart, which pumps blood stops, and once the blood stops to flow, you're dead. You're dead. That's how, that's how they test to see if, if you're dead. If a, if a paramedic shows up at the scene of an accident, he doesn't give you a brainwave test. He doesn't check you out to see if you got any kidneys. He checks your pulse to see if you're pumping blood. And if you're not pumping blood, you're pronounced dead at the scene. They try to revive you. And how do they try to revive you? By doing something with your brain? By doing something with your liver? By doing something with your feet, with your kidneys? No. They try to start your heart. Why? Because if, they can, if your body can pump blood, you're alive. At least alive enough to try it. Now we'll try to see if he's got any brain activity. But if your heart's not pumping blood, then there's no hope for any other part of you. And so it, it was, this is why God, uh, God chose the blood is because the life is in the blood. Blood is the most important substance on the earth. Um, now, I mean, there, did you, there, are, uh, there are 10 scriptures in the Bible that tell us not to eat blood. There are no scriptures in the Bible that tell us not to eat liver. But there are 10 scriptures in the Bible that say don't eat blood. Why? Because blood is sacred. The life is in the blood. And uh, so originally God instituted a system of the blood of animals being slaughtered and that, uh, that covered people's sins. But Hebrews 10, 4 tells us it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to remove sin. Impossible to remove sin. Can cover, could cover sins in the Old Testament. But remember what we read here in Hebrews until the, refer, the time of reformation, until the time that Christ came. And then when Jesus came, Jesus didn't just come to show us how to live. And there are people, there are people in other religions. I mean, uh, Muslims will tell you that Jesus was a good man. All major religions will tell you Jesus came to earth. Jesus was a good man. But when you start talking about his blood sacrifice on the cross, that's where everybody draws the line. That's where Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and every other world religion, they'll all tell you Jesus was a good man. He didn't come to be a good man. He came to die on the cross and shed sinless blood for our sins because the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of animals, could not wash away sins. They could only cover sins temporarily. And the whole reason that God instituted that that is, is so the world could, could understand the importance of the blood of a pure animal. So they've got, they're, they're used to blood. They're used to blood from a pure animal covering their sins, but they still know. The Bible says that that would not cleanse their conscience. The amazing thing about making a decision to follow Christ is all of a sudden your conscience is clean. I remember the night, I gave my life to Christ in 1973. It almost brings me to tears to talk about it because I can, I can remember it like it was yesterday. The, and the big thing that happened was my conscience was clean. I had the worst conscience. I had, my conscience was filthy. I, was, I felt guilty and shame about everything. I had done everything. Everything possibly wrong, I had done it. And I felt I'd go to church and I felt so guilty. I just felt like... Like I felt hopeless. And I remember when I gave my life to Christ, Jesus' blood, not only, it wasn't just a fact that Jesus' blood cleansed my sins, but he cleansed my conscience. These people taking bulls and goats to the priest and he's slaughtering the bulls and goats and then he's telling them, okay, your sins are covered. But they're leaving there with still a guilty conscience. They feel terrible. They're just taking the word of the priest who's given them the word of the Lord that their sins are forgiven. But when you make a decision to follow Christ, then he cleanses your conscience. That's what's so awesome about the blood of Jesus. The blood of, the blood of animals could not deal with 
the sin nature. Remember we talked about on the cross, the blood of bulls and goats did not remove the hamartia, the sin nature. The blood of bulls and goats covered individual sins. But when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sin nature on the cross. That's why we could be cleansed from uh, an evil conscience, the Bible says. It's because of what Jesus took on the cross. So 1 John 1, 7. I want you to turn with me there. We're almost finished. 1 John 1, 7. The book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he, Christ, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. His son cleanses us from all sin. Everybody say, that's good news. That's good news. That's good news. He cleanses us from all sin. And then verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then you go over to verse 12. I write to you, little children, technion, toddlers. I write to you, little children, stage two believers. I write to you, stage two believers, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So when we receive communion, uh, the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, when we receive communion, verse, uh, verse 16, tell you what, let's just go to, let's go over to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. This is Paul's revelation of the Last Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat this. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Every time we receive communion and we take that cup, we are proclaiming his death on the cross that we have been redeemed from our sin nature, that we have received the nature of God the, uh, we're, and we're becoming the righteousness of God. And then thirdly, we've been redeemed from the curse. We're proclaiming that every time we receive communion together. It's, it's amazing. You should, on your own Bible study time, you should do a study on the blood. Just use your concordance. On the back of your, all of your Bibles on the back of them, they have a concordance. You should go back, just go back there and look at the references in the New Testament to blood, to the blood, and look those things up. And it would be remarkable. I, don't, I wouldn't have enough time in all of these stage three sessions to teach everything the Bible says about the blood. And what the blood has done for us. What I've given you is uh, are the, the high spots and exactly why the blood of Jesus works. Has this been helpful? Oh, yes. About why the blood of Jesus works. Why blood? Why? Why? Isn't that kind of gross? You know, Jesus told his disciples one time he was out preaching and he told his disciples, um, uh, if, you, if you're going to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all, they all said, oh, that's gross. Drink your blood, Really? And they, they stopped following him. He lost all of his disciples except the 12 over that statement. If you're going to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, they, and they, they didn't stick around to find out what he was talking about or ask him what he meant. Or here's a guy who, who does miracles and walks on water and raises the dead. So maybe we could just rather than get grossed out, we should just hang around and maybe find out what this is about. You know, some people get offended at the least little things rather than just staying around to find out what stuff is about. Don't, don't do that. Um, but last scripture, Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. The believers overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So this is why 
major religions and then and people who who uh, maybe don't have any religion but they're opposed to Christianity. This is the thing that freaks them out about Christianity. A lot of people think Christianity, the, the basic tenets of Christianity are be nice to everybody. I, I talked to somebody the other, the other day. We got to talking and he asked me what I did for a living or whatever and he said, uh, um, and he was telling me about what he went to church, where he went to church and I said, so you're a Christian. And he said, yeah, I try to be nice to everybody. Which is, which is, I mean, it's admirable. I'm glad, but, but when somebody, when somebody says that, you know, they don't understand anything about the blood. Well, but what about your sin? Oh no, I'm, I'm, I, you know, the golden rule, you know, do unto others what you'd have them do unto you and be, and be nice to everybody. And don't, don't get mad when people do stuff and try to try to help. You know, if I drive down the road and I pass somebody and they got a flat tire, stop and help them. Yeah, I'm a Christian. What about our sin? Because we're not going to get into heaven because we're nice people. Nobody's good. Nobody's nice enough to get into heaven. Nobody is. Not me, not you, not nobody. All, Romans 6, 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so all of us need a savior. We don't just need to be nice. We need a savior. So then this is, but this is why the devil fights this whole thing so hard. I mean, there are whole churches we're talking about, we're talking about mainline denomination churches, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopals, there are all, all kinds of, not everybody, I'm not talking about all of them, but there are, there are whole churches that their whole thing is a social gospel. Hey, we're, we're, we're here to be nice to each, to everybody and to feed hungry people and to fight injustice. Hey, I'm all for fighting injustice and feeding hungry people. We do all, we do that here. I'm all for that. But that's not why Jesus came and died. He came and died because we needed a savior because we needed blood to wash away our sins. And the reason that the devil fights us so much, even in Christian circles, the reason he fights us so much is because of what I just read to you in Revelation chapter 12, 11, that we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we can be as nice as we want to and the devil will still continue to eat our lunch, beat us up, make us poor, make us sick, destroy our marriages, destroy our families. Uh, the devil will still continue to do that until we realize we overcome Satan by the blood, by the blood. Everybody say, thank God for the blood. Amen. Well, 